I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about uh, sensitivity of training process. Uh, one of them is going, one of the points I want to make is specific to uh, grading descent types of methods. The other point is uh, with respect to any of the, the model training approaches one might use, including the normal equation approach that we've already talked about. For the gradient descent mechanisms, uh, the question that is always nagging us is this issue of how many training steps do we actually need? And fundamentally, the answer varies with the type of problem, the type of model, and often the hyperparameters that we have associated with the model. So, so really, our, our only answer here is that this is really an empirical question. And the way we're going to get at this is by visualizing uh, our learning curve now this term learning curve, the book uh, uses it to mean something different. Um, the standard use of the term learning curve is, is this. So, so what, we're, what we do in the grading descent method is that we, uh, we start out with our random parameters. We, uh, we take some small number of steps, one or a small number of steps uh, of grading descent. We record the performance of the model. And we're going to record that with respect to the training set and an independent data set that I'm going to term the validation set. And then we're going to repeat that process. And we're, what we're going to do is watch how performance changes as a function of the uh, number of iterations that we throw at, at this particular learning algorithm. The other question that we want to get at is, is that of how much data do we really need? Uh, and uh, what we observed in the training that we've done so far is that our performance on our training set tends to be quite good, whether we're predicting position or velocity. But when we move over to uh, looking at an independent data set, the performance is really quite poor. And uh, in, in our case, what's happening is that even our simple linear model is dramatically overfitting our training data. And, and this comes from the fact that the number of parameters that we have uh, in our model is something equivalent or similar to the number of samples that we actually have in our training set. And, and really in practice, you want uh, your training set size to be quite a bit larger than uh, the number of parameters, unless you're, the, there, there are other ways to counter this, but, but one heuristic is to have quite a few more samples. In general, any time we're faced with a new machine learning problem, it is extremely important for us to understand how much training data we really need. And one approach uh, that we're going to code up here in a moment is that we're going to try training our models with varying amounts of training data. We're going to ask how much that model performs on an independent data set as a function of how much training data is available. In, in general, if what you're seeing is that you have a model that's sensitive to training set size, then what that probably tells you is that you are overfitting your data. So, so if I have a certain amount of training data and I increase it or decrease it a little bit and my model performance on an, an independent data set changes, then that, then that says we're probably overfitting the training data. On the other hand, uh, if I change my training set size a little bit and, uh, and we're not really seeing much change in performance uh, on the independent data set, then that tells us that we have plenty of training data. And in fact, we might want to uh, back off a little bit on how much training data we're using uh, if we're trying to save on computation time. All of these questions are very model specific and they're even specific to the hyperparameters that we're using for our models. So, so again, this becomes very much of an empirical type question. Okay, so, so let's go ahead and try a little bit of Python code uh, along both of these issues. I've already written part of the code here. Um, here I'm uh, creating a, an SGD regressor uh, object and I'm giving it some number of parameters. Um, a couple of the, the, the main differences in how I've set the parameters up are here. One is I'm only going to do 10 iterations, and that and that's because I want to I want to measure the performance 
if I want to measure the performance of the model every 10 iterations. And then the other, the other uh, parameter that I'm introducing here is uh, this warm start parameter. By default, this is false. And what false means is that every time we call model.fit, uh, we the model starts out by randomly generating uh, a new set of parameters before trying to do the gradient descent process. By setting warm start to true, what this means uh, is that uh, the model will pick up from uh, where it left off the last time it was training and keep training from there. Most of the time when we're writing code, we really want warm start to be false be because we're, gener we're generally testing models multiple times and we want to start in new random positions. Uh, in this case, however, we're going to uh, repeatedly ask the model uh, to, to, to improve itself a little bit and then ask it what its performance is and then improve itself again. Okay, so, so that's, that's our uh, SGD regressor. This function here that I've already typed in, uh, the idea is for it to implement our training loop. Um, and the, the idea here is uh, it's, it's going to keep a record of what the model performance is on the training set as well as this validation set. Uh, and it'll do a little bit of training, record performance, do a little bit more training, record performance, et cetera. So the inputs to this particular function are the, the model in question, the inputs for the training set, the outputs, the desired outputs for the training set, and then the inputs and desired outputs for the validation set. And then this n iter is just the number of iterations that we want to take uh, the, uh, this, we want to go through this process. I'm going to record the data in a, in a list, the performance data in a list. And so that's what this initialization is. We're just creating those, uh, those two lists. And then we're looping uh, n iter times. And at each step, here's our model.fit. So we're going to take 10 steps uh, using our training data set. This is, this is uh, we're, we're just ask, asking the model what it would predict on the training set and then calling my eval in order to evaluate uh, the data. So from that we're getting MSE, RMSE, and this RMSE in units of degrees. The validation set um, again, we're predicting and then asking what its performance is. And then these last two lines are all about just recording that performance. Um, remember that uh, when we have a list and we can uh, append something onto the end of, of the list. And then finally, outside of the for loop, once we're done, uh, this function just returns what those two lists look like. So let's go ahead and execute this, put that, push that into the Python environment, and uh, and then here here is us invoking that function that we just created. So model eight is the SGD regressor that we just created. Ins and outs six corresponds to fold zero of uh, shoulder position. Ins seven and out seven correspond to fold one of uh, the shoulder position. And we're going to do two hundred of these iterations. Go ahead and execute that. And of course, it's going to start throwing, in fact, a whole bunch of warnings. You'll see it's, it's uh, continuing to throw warnings. Um, the reason that this is happening is uh, it, it's actually complaining about the fact that uh, in the 10 steps that we're giving it uh, to, to make, uh, it's not reaching an adequate uh, performance. So, and every time we call model.fit, it, it's throwing this warning. And in, and in fact, we're calling this uh, 200 times. Okay. So this is all, uh, it, it is now finished up. Okay, so here's the, the code for visualizing our results. So we got back a list that corresponds to uh, our root mean squared error in units of degrees uh, for the training set and for the validation set. So we're plotting those uh, individually. 
in red and green. Uh, and then we're providing some labeling so we can make sense of this figure. Okay, so here, here's our result. What might be astounding here is that we have such a big difference between the training and validation sets. So, so what's going on here? Um, so first off with the, with the training set, uh, what you'll see, uh, where actually the performance is uh, starting out about comparable between the training and the validation sets. Um, but as we continue to train, uh, the training set performance continues to uh, improve. And in other words, root mean squared error is going down. And, and this is what we expect. We're doing gradient descent based on uh, mean squared error of the, of the training data. So we expect that to, to be dropping. And, and you'll notice that at some point, performance starts to asymptote. We're not quite there yet in these, uh, in these 200 steps, but, uh, but we're getting pretty close to the, the point where improvement is, will stop. But the, the other thing that's interesting here is that the green curve starts out by going down, which is also what we want, but you'll notice that it turns back up and begins to, to go back upwards. Uh, and, and this is a, a classic uh, picture of what things look like when we begin to overfit. Uh, so performance, uh, performance is going down as our, uh, as our model is uh, getting a handle on the general trends of, of the surface it's trying to learn. But at some point, it, it begins to uh, start to fit to very, the very specific points in the training data set. And, and, uh, and at that point, performance on any independent data begins to, to get worse. And, that, and that's why we're, we turn back upwards. Uh, we, we did an example early in, in the videos where we talked about using a linear model versus a quadratic mo model uh, versus, a, say, a 20-degree polynomial. And, and we talked about how the 20-degree polynomial can do really well uh, at fitting uh, the A-specific training set. Uh, but uh, when we ask it questions uh, about other points, it, the performance is quite poor. And that's exactly what's happening in this situation. Once this training uh, performance really does asymptote, we'll also see an asymptote in, in the validation performance because at that point, the, the model parameters have, have stopped training. So one, one way to, to get at this uh, question, or w one way to deal with the, the fact that validation set performance turns back upwards is actually to go into the model and say, we don't want to train for some fixed number of iterations. We're going to train as long as performance is going down, but as soon as it flattens out and begins to head upwards again, we're going to call that as done. And this is a technique called early termination. And, and it's very common, and this is built into uh, the, the regression algorithms, where you can say, here is a, a training set and here's a validation set and I want you to terminate when the validation performance starts to get worse. Okay, so, that, so that's one, one point I want to make here. And let's also look at uh, training size uh, sensitivity. And, and as I suggested, um, this is an issue not only for the SGD regressor, uh, or gradient descent uh, approaches, but this is also going to be an issue for our uh, uh, our uh, uh, linear regression uh, type of model, where, where we're using that that normal equation. Okay, we're going to go ahead and set up an, a new experiment, where we're going to use one of these linear regression objects. So we're using the normal uh, the normal equation for solving for the parameters. And, and what we're going to try is that uh, we're going to go into the available folds that we have. We have a total of 20 that are available. And we're, we're going to try training our linear regress regression 
uh, object using one fold uh, and asking what the performance is on that training set and an independent validation set. And then we're going to do the same here for, for the two here. This means I'm going to take the first two folds uh, in, in that uh, data set, use those for training, and then we'll ask how performance changes uh, with respect to uh, what, what the performance is for the training set and the validation set. And then we're going to try five training folds, eight training folds, 12 and 15. What's important whenever we're setting up uh, any of these experiments uh, is that uh, we hold the validation set uh, the same um, from one experiment to the other here. So, uh, so if I'm training on one fold, I'm going to validate on a particular fold. I'm going to choose fold 18 for this ex example. Uh, and then when I choose two uh, training folds, I'm still going to keep a fold 18 as the validation fold. And that's going to be the case for all of these uh, different experiments. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and execute that. And now it's time to write a little bit of code to implement this experiment for us. And, and this particular function is going to take as input some model. Okay, so um, what I mean by each of these parameters, um, this is the model we're going to be training. We're, I'm, I'm going to hand it all 20 folds, um, the inputs and the outputs. I, we're going to tell it which output column we're actually going to be worried about. In this case, we'll still focus on the shoulder column. And, and then this, uh, this pair here, Call this about fold instead. So folds is going to be a list of folds that we're going to use uh, for the training process. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this folds list is, is going to tell us how many training folds we're going to use uh, for each sub experiment. And then this val fold is going to tell us which uh, element of the, the ins and outs list that we're going to use for validation. And for simplicity, when I have just one fold, uh, when, when, uh, when I have just one fold, uh, I'm going to take fold zero from the data set that we have. When I have two folds, I'm going to take zero and one. With five, I'm going to take zero, one, two, three, four, and, and on down the line. So first off, we need a place to put our, our results. And then we're going to iterate over, over each item in this list here. And the next step, uh, it, each time through this for loop, we have to construct a proper NumPy training set. And that is, I mean, type the code and then we'll talk about it. So, so here we're focused on the, the input side of, of the uh, data. Um, so ins list is a list of NumPy arrays, one NumPy array per fold. What uh, this is going to, uh, to do is it's going to select uh, all of the folds from zero to F where F is not included. So when F is one, we're going to get a zero. When F is two, we're going to get zero and one. F is five, we're going to get zero through four, et cetera. This is going to give us, a, again, a list of NumPy arrays and then concatenate what it does is it takes the list of NumPy arrays and, and uh, combines them together into a single NumPy array. So, so we're just tacking in the case of two, we're tacking zero onto, uh, one onto zero. In the case of five, we're tacking together zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, we need to do this for the outside too. And, 
And right now we're just focused on one column. That'll be, we'll, we'll select our shoulder probably. And then for the validation set, I, I'm just going to, um, this val fold here, that's just a single fold from, from our data set. So we're just going to index into the list. And of course, we also want to select just the one column that we're interested in. And it helps if I spell things properly. There we go. So next step is to train the model. And then we're going to ask what uh, predictions it makes on the training set. And then we're going to evaluate that. The form of this particular, uh, of this particular loop actually looks a lot like the loop that we just implemented. All right, and now we're on to the validation set. And we have to evaluate that. And then finally, we need to record our results. I'm, again, I'm just going to record our root mean squared error in degrees. And then, and that's it. We're done with our loop. And we're going to return our two lists. Okay, so I pushed that now out into the Python environment and let's try calling that. Model, I'm going to hand it all of the neural data, all of the position data. I'm going to select column zero of the position data, so that's shoulder position. Uh, folds is the is the list of the different number of folds I'm using for training. And then finally, I'm going to select the 18th fold uh, for the validation purposes. Okay, so let's give that a try. Oh, and of course, I have an error. And it helps when my keys don't stick. Let's call this training, it was my intent all along. And it's M1 folds and theta folds that we need. You're uh, getting to see uh, debugging in process here. Okay, so now I think we're, uh, we're focused on, we're actually working here. Um, this is going to take a minute to run through this whole process. Um, remember that uh, we're, we have to uh, invert a fairly large uh, matrix uh, at each step of uh, the training process for this particular model. Uh, and uh, it is actually finished. Um, the learning process does take more time uh, as the number of folds uh, increases. So if you add a little bit of feedback to this, you'll see that one and two go by really fast and then five goes by. Uh, and then by the time we hit eight and 12, it starts to take a, a long time. Okay, the last step then is to 
uh, visualize the results. So here's the code to make that happen. So we're going to plot our root mean squared error for training and validation as a function of the number of training folds that we've used. Uh, and, and again, we've extracted only the RMSE in terms of degrees here. Okay, so, so this is a, a very typical uh, type of picture here. Um, so there are a couple of things going on. Um, so first off, uh, training set performance when number of folds is one is quite low, but the interesting thing is that that increases uh, as we start to add more uh, training data. And this is very typical in the machine learning world. Uh, and, and what's happening is that uh, as we add more and more training data, the, uh, we're, we're forcing the model to, uh, to uh, not overfit uh, the data as, as much. So another way to think about it is that when I have a very small amount of uh, training data, it's really easy to hit all of the points quite well in that training set. But as soon as I start to add more uh, training data, it uh, forces the model to start to generalize to larger and larger regions. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so we see this increase in, in error. Um, it's not a bad thing that, that this is uh, happening. This is uh, very, uh, very standard. Um, the good thing, though, is that as our training set uh, does increase uh, up beyond 10, that the training set performance levels off. If it continued to go up, then I would be worried about not having enough training data. On the contrasting side, let's look at what's happening with validation. So, so this is the point that we've been at for a lot of the models that we've already been training in our examples. And uh, as we're adding more training data, the, the model is actually uh, starting to uh, un overfit the data less and less, and we're getting the general trends uh, that exist uh, uh, across the, the data set. And at some point, these two curves actually come together and meet. And, that's, uh, and, and at, at this point, the, the model is, is capturing the the, the, the data trends and not uh, really capturing the specifics of the individual data points. And, and this is very much the type of scenario that we want to be in. We want these curves to be very near each other. Uh, it's not always the case that they cross, but, but they should be converging uh, together. So this is a, an approach that you're going to want to take for any uh, machine learning problem. Uh, that you're faced with and any new data set that you're faced with. Um, if you're in a scenario where your max training is sitting more around uh, this point here, around four, what we have uh, uh, shown here as four folds, then, then, that's, uh, then, then this is indicative of uh, a problem of not having enough data. So, so if I'm, if, if this is, the, the highest point I can, uh, I can reach on this curve, this tells me that it's likely to be the case that if I added some more training data that, I, that this error would continue to go up. And, and likewise, we're, we're seeing this error go down. Uh, if I stop right at this point here, the evidence that I have suggests that if I add more training data, then things are, are, are going to get better. Whereas if I'm sitting out in this region here, uh, Performance is relatively flat. Its performance is insensitive to how much uh, training data I throw at it. Uh, 15 uh, plus or minus one or two folds doesn't really matter. And, and, and so that tells me that I have a healthy amount of data here. Now there are other methods that we can use uh, to make more efficient use of the available training data. And even with the linear models that we have, uh, there, there are some techniques that we'll be able to, to, to use to improve these curves, even when we have a very small amount of training data. And we'll, we'll talk about that here pretty soon.